Welcome to CSAC uh, Honors Program Presentations. Um, I'm Rod Ewing. I'm a senior fellow at FSI and a professor in the School of Earth Sciences and a co-instructor with Professor Ziegart and Dr. Mir of the Honors Course. And it's my pleasure today to be the moderator for the two presentations, uh, which we'll listen to in just a moment. Um, I want to extend a special welcome to CSAC uh, uh, guests, friends, and family members uh, to this first in a series of four class meetings at, at which the honor students will present their uh, research results. I should note that the theses actually aren't due for another month. And so the students are still writing, uh, still thinking, and so comments and suggestions uh, would be both welcomed and timely. Uh, the procedure is we'll have uh, 20 minutes for the presentation, uh, followed by 10 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, Dr. Mir will be running the clock and signaling to the speakers. Uh, I should explain that the first round of questions will come from uh, the class members the advisor and the instructors. And as time allows, then we'll switch to um, posing the questions from the wider audience. And uh, to get your questions in the queue, please use the Q&A uh, button at the uh, bottom of your screen. And then at the end, Dr. Mir will um, uh, read those questions and we'll continue the discussion again as time allows. So with that introduction, we can start. The first speaker is Ben Boston, uh, studies political science and history here at Stanford. Uh, he's also president and captain of the men's lacrosse team. Uh, I won't uh, give you the title because that's on his first slide. And uh, so Ben, it's all yours. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yarn. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us today in these kind of strange, uncertain times. Uh, so I'll be presenting my CSAC honors thesis entitled America in East Africa, Security Partnerships, Aid Dependence, and Diplomatic Leverage. Um, this, the, this project takes on the question, why is the US able or unable to shape the actions of its allies? In an effort to offer you all a partial answer, I've spent the past year researching the US relationship with Kenya and Uganda. Uh, my focus is on, I would argue, the two most important events in relations with these nations and in these nations' histories generally, um, military adventurism and the liberalization of domestic politics. My findings elevate coercive diplomacy as the key explanatory variable. So where are we gonna to go today? Um, we'll begin with a quick presentation of my methodology, sources and research design. Uh, I will then give you the three dominant explanations uh, for a strong state, in this case, the United States, is influence over the actions of its weaker allies. Um, before taking you through two of my case studies, one on the 1991 Kenyan legalization of multi-party politics, and the other on the 1998 Ugandan invasion of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, in each instance, I will draw upon my comparison case to illustrate contrast. I will then present my findings before discussing their relevance to academic literatures and policy making. Uh, so first, my research design and methods. Uh, this project, as I said, is a comparative examination of four cases, trying to explain the variation in policy decisions made by Kenya and Uganda. Uh, crucially, this isn't an outcome focus, so we're not trying to see how long a war lasted or how bad it was, but just whether the decision to invade was made or not um, and how that decision kind of took place. Um, I would test three candid explanations, which I will present next, um, and worked using a variety of sources in this project, particularly interviews with key American policymakers, uh, reporting from all three nations and more broad reporting and the limited academic writing on these cases. Um, so as I said, I have three theoretical frameworks that I draw from in an attempt to explain. The first theory, the first explanation is balance of interests. The second, dependence. And the third, coercive diplomacy. 
So first, balance of interest. Balance of interest theory modifies uh, kind of classic balance of power theories. It emphasizes the preferred outcome of each party as well as their stake in seeing that preferred outcome. This is typically used to explain, explain engagement between foes. Think of the US and Iran, for instance, but it works as well in alliances. Uh, in general, it suggests that the more the US cares about an outcome, the more likely the United States is to see that outcome implemented. Uh, however, there is a bit of a modification. Weaker states can take their preferred action on issues they hold to be incredibly important that the stronger state finds relatively unimportant. The second theoretical explanation that I draw from is dependence. Uh, this builds off theory, theorizing about hierarchy, and alliance structure, um, and it focuses on the relationship between states. So rather than um, a measure of power or interest, how those states interact in general. Um, in my selected cases, we find the US providing a large amount of aid and security support kind of across the board, which should indicate US leverage and push us towards seeing an outcome more favorable to the US. There is also the possibility, which I don't really discuss at length in this presentation, but I'm happy to take questions on, of a, a countervailing dependence, wherein logistical support for US troops um, and provision of forces for US security interests by Kenya or Uganda might undermine dependence and work in the opposite direction. The third theory is course of diplomacy. Uh, this is originally applied as well to relations between adversaries. Uh, in this project, I've modified it, including tools like sanctions, aid provision or conditionality, uh, naming and shaming, or recognition and praise um, to work in an alliance. Unlike the first two explanations, course of diplomacy takes interests as a start point. Um, so it's agent focused. It, it's not a structural theory, but instead it looks at what a country cares about, what it kind of has available, given how much it cares to ex exact its interest and goes from there. It's a little bit less predictive, obviously, than the other two. Um, so we really ex are looking for a variation from the outcomes predicted by balance of interest or dependence. All right, so on to the cases. As I said, I'm gonna be looking at two cases. First, the Kenyan liberalization of domestic politics in 1991. Um, so Kenya, um, had been ruled since independence in 1963 by the Kanu party for most of that period functioning as a pure one party state without competitive multi-party elections. Um, under the guidance of its first president, Jomo Kenyatta pictured here, uh, Kenya aligned itself closely with the West and the United States. There was a, I think, kind of Cold War strategic logic for the US in this. East Africa was a region full of states otherwise who were either non-aligned or Soviet aligned. So the US liked having a friend in the area. Uh, for Kenya, those same Soviet and non-aligned states, Soviet aligned and non-aligned states uh, threaten Kenyan security. So there's a shared interest in partnership. Additionally, Kenya received a ton of assistance from the US, which makes partnership feel even better. Uh, Daniel Arat Moy, who I'll be focusing on today in this case, is um, Kenyatta's successor. Uh, he takes over in, 1990, in 1978 um, after Kenyatta's death and embarks upon a closing of already quite restricted domestic politics. So, our case picks up about a decade after Kenyatta takes office towards the end of the Cold War. Um, in 1989, George, President George H.W. Bush appoints Smith Hempstone as his ambassador to Kenya. Hempstone had been up to that point a career journalist, never a policymaker or diplomat. Um, and he's a staunch conservative, has a reputation for being a really kind of maverick figure. Um, he arrives at a sort of opportune moment for the pressure campaign he's about to embark upon, um, the Kenyan uh, Kenyan one-party rule, Kanu had just instituted a particularly egregiously rigged vote in 1988, and there was an economic crisis due to largely um, commodities price surges. So there's kind of a broad domestic discontent with the Kenyan leadership. Uh, Hempstone arrives in Nairobi and basically embarks upon a ferocious campaign of what academic literature calls naming and shaming. Uh, this is a tactic that's more often used by journalists, NGOs, civil society organizations to call attention to human rights abuses. And Hempstone, maybe because of his journalistic background, uh, turns to it to kind of, with the almost flamethrower level of intensity, to call out the Kenyan government's corruption and repression. At the same time as Hempstone is really publicly highlighting this, the United States is tightening the screws on the Kenyan government uh, using the lever of its large amount of aid provision. Um, this culminates in a declaration of aid conditionality. So basically telling Kenya that 
unless you liberalize your domestic politics and your economy, uh, we will cut off aid, um, not just by the United States, but this is, is done at a conference in November of 1991, uh, also including countries like the UK, Germany, France, Japan, so on, and institutions like the um, IMF and World Bank. Um, a, just a week after this declaration, President Moy announces a decision to legalize multi-party politics. So this seems like a kind of straightforward success case for American coercion, however we want to define it. The US applies pressure um, and Moy liberalizes, but Moy wins re-election in December of 1992, runs again in 1997 and wins again. Um, he finally steps down in 2002, a full decade after the US pressure campaign begins. So we're left a little bit questioning whether this is an American success and if so, how. Um, to try to explain this, I drew upon my other case, which looks at um, the similar effort by the United States to liberalize Uganda in 2005. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, looking across Canada explanations with balance of interests, we see the US has a kind of moderate normative interest in affecting liberalization Kenya has an existential interest, obviously, in retaining power. Um, repressive regimes, whatever their kind of branding, don't like to leave office, and it sort of makes sense. Um, as far as dependence, Kenya is highly dependent upon USAID for the provision of public goods, um, things like public health, education. This kind of predicts that we should see maybe even a rapid liberalization. Uh, and then finally, coercive diplomacy. So the US applies a combo of sort of public pressure via naming and shaming. This becomes more private and a little bit more measured after Ambassador Hempstone, but continues until 2002. Um, and that cu is coupled with aid conditionality, both in 1991 and also throughout the 1990s. Um, so is it kind of, is, are we seeing dependence or coercive diplomacy? Is there a multiplier effect from American coercive efforts? So in comparison with Uganda in 2005, um, it's a similar case President Museveni in Uganda wants to hold power. Um, the United States wants to promote kind of liberalization. So we see similar initial pressure and similar liberalization in the short term, a return to multipartyism. But over the long term, there's a lack of sustained effort by the United States, uh, no either public or private pressure really, and no lasting liberalization. So from that, we can sort of conditionally conclude that it is the coercive diplomacy of the United States sustained over a decade that affects liberalization in Kenya. Um, so we step now to my second case uh, of four. This is the Ugandan invasion of the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 1998. To understand this, there's a pretty complicated history that you, I'm happy to answer questions about either offline or in the kind of Q and A section. Uh, the short version is that Uganda and as well as their more kind of gung ho Rwandan allies in 1996 are really scared of cross-border rebel groups in what's then Zaire. And so they launch an invasion to overthrow the longtime autocratic ruler of Zaire, um, Mobutu. The US offers what's a still disputed level of support to this effort. Um, we certainly kind of liked it. We were, you know, Mobutu had once been a US proxy. We had kind of grown less fond of him, sort of an embarrassing figure. Uh, and we're broadly supportive of the Rwandan and Ugandan regimes particularly after the tragedy of the Rwandan genocide. Um, but it's still disputed how much support exactly we offer. In any case, um, in the aftermath of this invasion, Rwanda and Uganda install a um, kind of Congolese sort of low-level resistance politician, uh, Laurent Desiré Kabila, as the president. Um, and this goes okay for a little bit, but there's an obvious tension between Kabila and his backers, particularly as they leave troops across the country to kind of remind him of who's boss. Um, and so Kabila in July of 1998 expels um, Rwandan and Ugandan troops from the DRC. In response to this, three weeks later, just over three weeks later, Uganda and Rwanda launch an invasion of the DRC. Um, I say invasion, there's mild dispute about this because it does work in part through proxies of each country, but it's, it's really, I would argue, an invasion that I argue in my chapter is an invasion. Um, so we look at this, okay, what was the US interest here? And why did the US let two of their partners, two of their closest allies in Africa do something that seems to go against what they wanted? Well, 
the United States publicly declared about a month after the invasion that it was opposed to the invasion, it condemns it, it's not in the US interest. And there is a pretty strong US interest, I, I kind of classify it as moderate at least, um, in averting a humanitarian catastrophe, averting a conflict in Congo. However, this is a little bit um, muddled because the US also doesn't really like Laurent Desiree Kabila. He's kind of a ruler of the 1960s rather than the 1990s. He doesn't play nice with any sort of foreign engagement. Um, and in contrast, we are quite friendly with the leadership of Uganda and also of Rwanda. So our, our interests aren't really clear here necessarily. Uganda, meanwhile, has a strong interest in overthrowing Kabila. Um, there are a couple of reasons behind this that I detail. One, the cross-border rebels, same as 1996. Two, continued access to DRC's resources, which had begun to enrich uh, military and political elites in Uganda. And three, the sort of competitive alliance structure between Uganda and Rwanda. So a, a weird inversion of dependence there. Um, meanwhile, in terms of dependence itself, we see Uganda is pretty highly dependent upon the US for humanitarian and security assistance. So you'd, you'd expect the US should have some leverage here that is not in fact carried out. Um, and as for coercive strategy, as I detailed, there's little coercion. So how can we understand this? Um, well, I bring in now my comparison case, the Kenyan invasion of Somalia in 2011. Um, similar driver for Kenya here, fearing um, cross-border rebel groups. Um, the U.S. has even stronger equities in Somalia. I'm happy to get into that in the comments as well. Um, and so the U.S. pushes for no invasion um, in its interactions with the Kenyans. Kenya ultimately does invade about a year to two years after raising this invasion with the US in line with broader preferences of the United States. So we see similar kind of balance of interest and dependence, um, a moderate US course of effort, um, which doesn't stop an invasion importantly, but does produce an invasion more in line with US interests, maybe splitting hairs. Um, so what can we conclude from all of this? And you know, I'll forgive you if your head's spinning a little bit, it's, it's a lot of ground to cover. Um, I find a couple of things, if helpfully number them in order for you. One, different types of event are most influenced by different structural factors. So this is kind of a, before we even try to understand what the US can do, what are we looking at? So balance of interest is more important in invasion cases. Um, I think this kind of makes intuitive sense. If you have Al-Shabaab across your border threatening you if you're Kenya, um, if you're Uganda and you have rebel groups across the border threatening you, you're gonna be really keen on removing that threat and having an ally tell you, please don't do that, maybe it's not so convincing. The opposite is true for liberalization. So we find that um, high levels of dependence tend to promote some degree of liberalization or be more important. I, I kind of hypothesize I'm still developing this, so I'm happy to take criticism or feedback, but a hypothesis wherein um, outside support offers its own assistance in legitimizing a ruler um, and helps in public good provision that keeps the ruler in power. So there's a kind of interest in making some show liberalization in order to hold on to power um, by keeping foreign support. Two, um, we see that course of diplomacy can shift outcomes predicted by these structural factors. So it can't change them. We can't overturn them, but we do see that um, with consistency and pressure in the Kenya case, most notably the Kenya liberalization case, um, there is a political liberalization. President um, Daniel R. Moy does leave power after sustained U.S. pressure. Um, at the same time, there are limits to coercion, I think demonstrated by, these are, Africa is never the most important thing in American foreign policy during these periods. Other priorities come first. And so we see that even in the sort of maximal success case, it's not an instant dramatic shift. It's a gradual shift and then sustained pressure over time, leading eventually to a, a kind of, you know, semi-peaceful change in power via elections. Um, at the same time, contradictory interests from the strong state prevent coercion. So this is basically what happens with the invasion of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The U.S. has an interest, a relatively strong interest for its politics in Africa in preventing invasion, but it also has an interest in backing its allied states, it can't really align those things or it would be costly to do so. And so instead the US withholds from action. Um, and then finally ends match the means. So 
coercion over a moderate preference in all four of these cases, um, because that's, as I said, what they are, just moderate preferences, can generate no more than moderate concessions. So you see this, a liberalization kind of one step at a time, not all at once. What does this mean for academic work? Uh, well, there's a very small literature on the agency of African states in defining the preferences of external powers, the United States, but also China, France, Britain, and so on. Um, this work kind of stands, I think, on the flip side of that coin, looking at how external powers, in this case, the United States, but you could apply a similar sort of research framework to China, to Britain, to France, and so on, um, seek to have their preferences enacted in Africa. Uh, so my work tries to deepen the scholarly understanding of the cases I've examined while giving a sort of simple model for testing coercive diplomacy as an explanatory theory um, in cases across Africa. So you could apply this to looking at the US in Nigeria or to Britain and South Africa and, and so on. Um, as for policy, what does this mean? Well, um, Africa and especially East Africa have become an area of kind of growing global interest from outside actors. Um, China is sort of the headline of this. You all have probably read stories on China and Africa and the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but a number of states, Turkey, Qatar, the UAE, so on, have all gotten involved in what you would think of as very local disputes in this area and have provided pretty substantial investment. Uh, so I think this fits in with the broader theme we're seeing in our domestic politics and foreign policy, which is the sort of end of unquestioned American dominance. Uh, and this leads, in my opinion, to a need for a better understanding of the limits to power. Uh, so I talked about that you can only achieve modest ends with modest means. Um, and I think the conditions of the 1990s, when the US can get all of Kenya's donors together and agree to push Kenya to liberalize and, and even in some ill-defined way and cut aid until they do so is very unlikely to happen today. Um, and so these, these challenges become kind of ever more important. So I wanna quickly close before my time is up with a thank you to all of the people who've helped me. First and foremost, my advisor, Jeremy Weinstein, um, also to Amy and Rod and Asfandiar for running a fantastic program, to the cohort for being lovely and tolerating my very, very baritone voice, which I guess you guys have done as well, listening. And then finally, to all the friends at Stanford, hopefully a few of whom have tuned in and who, I, you know, fingers crossed we can have some kind of fun then to our time, even if it's not quite in person. Uh, thank you so much. Ben, thank you. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have uh, stimulating questions. Uh, we'll start, uh, as a courtesy, uh, with the advisor, uh, Professor Jeremy Weinstein. Um, Thanks so much, Rod. Ben, uh, congratulations on a fantastic job. You also clean up really nicely, uh, so I appreciate uh, the tie and the jacket, although I'm sure there are shorts, lacrosse shorts underneath or something. Um, uh, I think you did a terrific job pulling this all together, so I want to ask you one question about uh, something you learned, and then uh, a question that's really an extrapolation uh, to a contemporary policy problem. So on the first, the question about what you learned, you know, initially when you began to frame this project, you talked about states, you talked about the interests of Kenya, the interests of Uganda, the interests of the United States. Um, but part of what you did in your data collection exercise was begin to get inside these states and to understand who the actors are. And so I wonder if you can say a bit more about how understanding the bureaucratic politics and the competing interests uh, within the US government is critical to making sense of some of the independent variables that you're focused on. That's the question. The, the, the extrapolation um, is that if there's a political transition in the United States in, in 2021, um, one challenge that a new president will face um, is a longstanding challenge that both Democrats and Republicans have had to encounter, which is what to do about authoritarianism and questions of liberalization in the Middle East. And I wonder what lessons you would draw from your analysis about the efficacy of tools of coercive diplomacy uh, in Africa for, uh, for a policy making process that is trying to grapple with number one, the commitment that the United States has to the pursuit of particular values in its foreign policy, uh, 
but number two, the challenge of incentivizing uh, political change in the Middle East and North Africa. Sure, um, it's a lot, a lot to bite off there. So I'll start on U.S. bureaucratic politics. So I think that this is one of the most important things that I came across in each of these cases. Um, and it's something I'm grappling with how to include in the final draft of my thesis, which is that there is never a perfectly coordinated policy for the U.S. There's never a perfectly coordinated preference. There is always competition between different branches of government, in particular sort of military slash intelligence branches um, and kind of the State Department, but also within sort of different actors in the State Department um, having their own unique biases about say Kenyan capabilities to manage uh, invasion successfully. Um, and, and so I think that that is really important. And a, a lot of what I'm gonna consider as explanatory has to do, for instance, in the, um, the case with the invasion of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the longer story of that is not complete without a consideration of the experience of many of those same policymakers who stood by and, and didn't really act to stop this invasion. Um, and there's sort of this kind of geopolitical rationale to that, but there's also a deeply personal rationale, which is that they had not taken a strong action in re with regards to the Rwandan genocide. And it's impossible to know whether such an action was, could have been constructed or could have changed the course of events there, but there certainly was the specter of that decision on their minds and, and perhaps a certain debt that was felt to the Rwandans and, and a bunch of other things beyond that. Um, in terms of the challenge of a political transition in 2021 or 2025 um, and what to do about the question of liberalization in the Middle East and North Africa, um, I think this project really demonstrates to me the limits to uh, the efficacy of coercive tools at affecting change in the world. The case I've described with, with the Kenyan liberalization is probably the high watermark for the U.S. promotion of a, a kind of political opening anywhere in the world just about that I can think of. Um, and, and I've been struck consistently by the shortcomings to U.S. efforts and the fact that it takes 10 years. And there, there's even an article written, academic article in 2001, that highlights Western failure to promote democratization in Kenya. Um, and, and Kenyan democratization is very imperfect. So I think it, it, it prompts a note of caution about at least expectations of short-term success. Um, but there is also, I think, a path towards a kind of long-term, if you keep on pushing the same thing and, and you have a vision for creating very small and very gradual openings, if you can think in a long-term period, that may be impossible in modern politics. There is some small space for, I think, potentially promoting liberalization, not as a first preference necessarily. Um, all right, Ms. Fonier, so how are we taking the next questions? Uh, let me, uh, I'll be uh, checking with the members of the class for questions, but before we do that, let me just remind those who are in the audience, say outside of the class, uh, please send in your questions using the question answer tab at the bottom of the screen and we'll combine uh, or compile those as we go. So let me ask now, are there questions from uh, the class? Just raise your hand, I can. So, so uh, the, the order of the queue is uh, Professor Ziegard, and then, uh, and okay. then Sophia Boyer. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. You can I'm unmuted, I assume, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So Ben, let me just echo what Jeremy said. It's a terrific thesis, a really great presentation, and you're the first presenter in our Zoom Doom and Gloom uh, CSAC <laughs> Honors presentation. So kudos to you. I want to pick up on a theme that you've raised throughout your thesis, which is consistency of coercive diplomacy. So you talk about how it's really important to be consistent and you note in the Kenyan case that coercive diplomacy sort of stutters uh, because it's not consistent at some point. So I wanna ask you why you think coercive diplomacy wasn't consistent 
in that case? Are we talking about when, when course of diplomacy isn't consistent, is that a failure of implementation or a shifting of relative priorities in government? Uh, because you could argue if you make the aperture bigger, maybe Kenyan liberalization was less important than other priorities. Help me understand, what did you find? Was it something about the implementation of course of diplomacy or a shifting of the relative interests of policymakers across different priorities? Um, so so the, the Uganda case actually gives, I think, the best example of this where there's sort of one team working on pressure on President Museveni um, as he's coming to a term limited end of his tenure as leader in 2005, um, a constitutionally mandated term limit. And this is in particular led by the ambassador, Jimmy Colker at the time. And he's supported in Washington by a, a few different figures in the Bush administration at pushing Museveni. And he does, it's a limited push. So there's no negative coercion. There's no threat of aid conditionality, anything like that. But there's a, a strong, consistent message in a few different ways about, you know, you really should consider stepping down. Here's kind of a retirement plan. You can go work at the UN, all these things. And um, Museveni doesn't step down. He does liberalize domestic politics and, and reintroduce multipartyism. So he takes a step as a kind of conciliatory gesture. Um, and then the personnel changes. So I think that to get to your question, it's, it's about shifting interests from the US. Um, and it's particularly about, um, about changes in personnel. So a new set of personnel come in, a new ambassador, a new assistant secretary of state for African affairs, um, maybe new NSC personnel as well. And they have a, just kind of a little bit more positive preconception of Museveni than those. And that's not to say that the previous conception was negative, just that they are not as interested in pushing this specific policy. And um, actually Museveni also takes certain actions. I, I talked about the literature on African leaders seeking agency. So Museveni does a few things that make the U.S. much more dependent on him. Um, and so I, I think that is, it's about shifting interests definitely. And I think there's the bureaucratic politics piece of that is really important. Who works on these issues matters a lot. Um, but there's also, it's important to remember two sides to this. And, you know, we see that that's one, one argument could just be made. Museveni is really smart and he's a really, you know, good geopolitical thinker. And he, he deploys peacekeeping troops for a key U.S. priority. And that kind of convinces America to um, tamp down pressure. Ben, really good job. It was a great presentation. Um, could you speak to how the models that you explored in your presentation and your ultimate findings could be applied or have been applied to our key to key U.S. allies with similar interests in the region? Um, so, so like, how does how does Britain or the, the EU writ large pursue this? Yeah. Um, so, European states in Africa, with the very notable exception of the French, kind of a, a wild card actor. But in general, Europe and the US tend to work pretty closely together on African foreign policy. Um, the US and UK ambassadors especially often are kind of on the same page, advocating for the same things. Um, and we see, we see in these cases that, um, for instance, in, in this Ugandan liberalization case, Britain actually goes further than the U.S. and applies aid conditionality to some extent to Uganda and cuts some of its aid um, and packages that as being about trying to push Museveni to respect term limits. So, so most often these are efforts that, um, that entail the U.S. leading a group of like-minded nations and, and, and drawing on their support as a multiplier. And one thing I think that would be different about this project looking at a crisis right now in, in 2018 and 2019 and 2020, um, if you want to look at say liberalization in Ethiopia, where there's sort of a similar uneasy process going on, you would have to have a theoretical consideration for the interests of other outside powers and especially China. And the fact that maybe the US, there's this sort of assumption in my project of the US acts and it has this multiplier of Japan and Britain and Germany all and so on, all wanting similar things and working with them. And I, I, that assumption is not quite as true. And there's kind of a counter to that. 
now we have a question uh, from our attendees. Uh, 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 first question is from Jake Dell. Uh, Jake uh, was a CSAC class of 2019 and he says, hi Ben, great work here. I'm interested if you can elaborate on the China element you raised at the end. Uh, coercion and dependence seems to rely uh, on an assumption of a lack of available alternatives for states like Kenya. So how can we apply the lessons from this period of unipolar hegemony for US to an environment where states can shop for support? Um, well, thank you. Thank you to Jake for that. So this is something I've been wrestling with a lot because the most recent of my cases, so the Kenyan invasion of Somalia does start to bring in the Chinese element a little bit because China by this point is providing substantial developmental assistance to Kenya. Um, and there is one argument that I don't find entirely convincing, but there is an argument to be made that it is in part this knowing, Kenya knows it has support from China, and so therefore it, um, it is able to be more aggressive in doing something the U.S. is not fond of than it would have been in, say, 1998 or 2002. Um, so as far as modifying this work, in a multipolar world, a more competitive world, I think that the, the findings about the efficacy of coercion definitely do need to be modified. And I actually am not sure how. This is something I'm thinking about as I write my conclusion chapter. Um, I believe that it's much, it is much more difficult to successfully push a, something like liberalization when states can turn to China in the short term and um, kind of escape that pressure. So I, I think there's, there's definitely work to be done and, and I'm interested in trying to do it to see, well then what kind of coercive strategy can take multipolarity into account? But I, I really don't know yet. So uh, we have another question from, from the audience. Um, and this one is uh, from Morgan Kaplan, who is the editor of International Security, says, Hi, Ben. What was the biggest finding that surprised you or ran counter to what you anticipated you'd find before beginning your casework? Uh, thanks for a great presentation, Morgan Kaplan. Um, that's tricky. I mean, there were a lot of things. I guess I should lead with first, I had expected to do this looking at British influence in East Africa and had to change the entire project in late fall because the British acted in lockstep with the Americans on nearly everything. Um, but as, as far as the biggest surprising finding, um, I think it was, I had gone into it expecting that there was a sort of model of success with Kenya and failure with Uganda, and that there was going to be something really about the way we interacted with those two countries that was really different. So I was very surprised to find that the US was actually able to have this degree of short-term success in pressing Museveni um, and in, in securing this kind of partial liberalizing concession. Um, I, had, I had kind of entered with, there's a lot of academic writing on how good President Museveni is at evading international pressure. Um, so that's, I think, the, the, biggest, the biggest thing that changed where my, my work was going was seeing that it wasn't so simple as kind of a model of there is greater success with Kenya than Uganda. And this one is, is not a question, just, uh, just a comment message from Drew Semler, who says, no questions, just admiration for a job well done. So proud of this guy. Thank you to Drew for that. Okay. All right. So any more questions? I don't see any in the, the Q&A tab. Jeremy, if you like to say some concluding words, you can you can take the floor. I didn't know I was going to be put on tap to uh, make a toast at the end of this presentation, but uh, Ben, you did a terrific job. Uh, you described to Morgan the the big pivot that you had to take, uh, which was an initial focus on the UK and needing to shift to the United States. Uh, you hungrily took up every opportunity to engage former senior policymakers, who I think probably reveled in telling you war stories of their time in Kampala and uh, Nairobi. 
and you've done an amazing job of bringing it together in the analysis and the writing. Uh, so I hope you find a way to celebrate. Uh, of course, you still need to finish the write-up of the thesis. So <laughs> for some reason, Amy Rod and Asfandiar have this, this celebratory moment coming before all the work is done, uh, but I look forward to seeing the final product. Congrats. Thank you, Jeremy. All right. All right. Uh, Asfandiar, I think we, we've done. Yes, we can. It's um, at this point that I do this. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's move on. Uh, the next speaker is Eva Frankel. Uh, she studies bioengineering and she has an interest in biosecurity and bioethics, uh, which shows up uh, clearly in her thesis. And again, I'll let her show her title and uh, begin. Can you all hear me? Yes. Awesome. Oh. And you need to share your screen. Yeah, let's do this. There you go. You can all see it? Yes, we can. Great. So hello. Um, I'm Eva Frankel, and I am writing my thesis on insider threats in biological laboratories. So in 2001, five people died and 17 people were injured as a result of anthrax mailed through the U.S. postal system. And the alleged perpetrator, who is the image on the right, Dr. Bruce Ivins, was a biodefense researcher and an employee at the time at the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. So he was a government employee. Although some controversy remains over whether he was the true perpetrator of the attacks, the Amerithrax attacks sparked concern over bioterrorism in the United States, especially directly in the wake of 9-11. They were also a lone insider attack, meaning that Bruce Ivins was acting alone and was a trusted employee of the laboratory. So he had privileged access to the materials. While the Amerithrax attacks were a terrifying reminder of the impacts of bioterror, they were not mass casualty attacks. The World Health Organization defines mass casualty attacks as attacks that overwhelm healthcare capacity. However, there is evidence of the capability and intent to perpetrate such mass casualty attacks. Um, state bioweapons programs such as Bio Preparat in the Soviet Union worked towards the development of weaponized anthrax and even genetically engineered bioweapons. Furthermore, non-state actors such as Aum Shinrikyo and Al-Qaeda have expressed interest in developing uh, bioweapons for mass casualty attack, Aum Shinrikyo in the 90s, and it's now more defunct. Um, a comprehensive government analysis of biosecurity threat assessing the biosecurity risk of research on viruses determined that lone insiders with a gross threat from using these viruses, having both the capability and possibly the intent to weaponize uh, pathogens. This report looked at a variety of different actor types and a variety of different possible malicious actions, um, including virus acquisition and use, and lone insiders stuck out as being a concern for the misuse of viruses. So the scenario that is most concerning now to individuals based on this comprehensive report is a virus uh, used by a lone insider. My research question interrogates why there has never been a mass casualty attack uh, by lone insiders using pathogens. People have been sounding the alarms about these mass casualty attacks, um, but they haven't happened. And it's worthwhile to investigate why and how we can keep the state of affairs intact. My thesis takes a historical angle uh, to assess the hypotheses about why there have been no cases of lone insiders using pathogens to cause mass casualty attacks and what the policy and scholarship implications might be. I will be interrogating two hypotheses rooted in the literature. Um, first, I will be exploring whether lone insiders have the capability to use pathogens for mass casualty attack. There has been a lot of disagreement in the literature over whether weaponizing pathogens is easy or hard, and that's normally how it's talked about as this is easy or this is hard. Um, on the side for weaponizing pathogens being relatively easy, some scholars argue that as more life sciences information is disseminated, it becomes increasingly simple to weaponize pathogens. And on the side for it being hard, there's an argument that tacit knowledge, which is non-codified, non-verbal knowledge that you can only acquire by being an expert or watching an expert at work and practicing a lot, um, constitutes a key obstacle in the process for lone insiders for their use of biological weapons. 
Second, I will be exploring whether lone actors are motivated to cause mass casualty attacks. Here, the literature states that those who would most want to perpetrate a mass casualty attack would be scorched earth actors with an extremist ideology, um, typically an extremist religious ideology or an apocalyptic ideology. So I am assessing why these two circles in this Venn diagram of capability and motivation don't seem to have intersected despite repeated calls that we would expect them to. I find that historically enabling technologies like virus synthesis were limited to a small subset of scientists and were actually not widely dispersed. I also find that perpetrators of biocrimes or small scale bioterror attacks are not motivated by religious extremism or religious ideologies. And finally, that these are trends that are changing. Testing my first hypothesis about capability, I find that it is mostly true that lone insiders cannot easily weaponize a pathogen for a mass casualty attack, although it will not be true for long. Um, it has not been an impossibility. There are some people who could do it, but the use of that enabling technology has been limited to a small subset of early adopters. You can think of it like the half of the Venn diagram, so the people with the capability is pretty small. Um, but nonetheless, we do have to think about this as every person capable of weaponizing a pathogen is a threat. Most assessments of the capabilities of lone insiders have focused on the what and how. So what do lone insiders need to weaponize pathogens in terms of resources and money? And how would they do so? So how would the protocols and the codified knowledge make it easier for lone insiders um, to weaponize pathogens? Um, I will be taking a different tack and I'll be focusing on the who. So who are the communities that have the expertise to use and operationalize these technology advances for mass casualty attacks? First, I grounded my research in existing literature on the what and the how, which reveals that the most common um, concerning enabling technology for pathogen weaponization is virus synthesis. Virus synthesis may make it easier for someone to figure out how they would make a pathogen. Then I gathered bibliometric data on key actors in synthetic virology via Scopus to characterize the historic population of people capable of implementing virus synthesis. And I found that they were early adopters, which sets a threshold of expertise required to take advantage of this enabling technology that actually excludes most lone insiders. Um, so the threshold is pretty high. So this is um, an example of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine's report findings. And this shows that recreating known viruses is the highest concern capability. And this is due to enabling technologies such as DNA sequencing and DNA synthesis that make it easier to find the sequence of viruses. And then once those are found to construct and test viruses. Um, and for those of you who don't know, viruses are constructed of DNA with a protein capsule or of RNA with a protein capsule. So this is essentially the basis of a virus. What are early adopters? And why did I say that I think that the small subset of scientists are early adopters? So this is one lens of how to think about technology adopters, such as um, synthetic virology. I borrowed this concept from innovation theory. It's the concept of the S-curve. Initially, a very small proportion of a given population adopts the technology. And then a few more people do, maybe there's some startups and the technology takes off. When you think about the traditional biosecurity arguments of what is easy and what is hard in synthetic virology, the arguments about tacit non-codified knowledge lie in the realm of innovators and early adopters. This is the idea that there's some knowledge that lies only in the hands of experts. As technology gets codified, open source and easy to use, we would expect to move up this S curve. But instead of thinking about synthetic biology explicitly as easy or hard, we can ask ourselves where we lie on this trajectory. Who are the communities that are capable of using this technology? And I establish a threshold of the early majority as the place where we would see a technology take off. Once we've hit this point with synthetic virology, the genie is out of the bottle because the technology is widespread due to its beneficial applications. On this curve, synthetic virology research of concern is here. Um, so we are in the early adopter subset and barring regulatory hurdles, we're ramping off for takeoff to this being codified knowledge. Here's how I know. There are existing characterizations of early adopters in biotechnology. Using an econometric analysis of bibliometric data of early adopters in CRISPR, which is another very important and influential biotechnology, Thompson and Zions established that early adopters in biotechnology share some key characteristics. For example, they publish across a wide variety of areas, they have high impact publications, and they tend to publish with fewer co-authors. I then collected the bibliometric data from Scopus of researchers 
historically performing synthetic virology research of concern to construct a bibliometric data set that would give us insight into where they fell on this curve. And I found that they shared the traits identified as being traits of early adopters in biotechnology. So they have many years of experience. They have high H indices, which are measures of impact for scientists, and they publish across many areas, although they tend to publish most commonly in immunology, microbiology, and biochemistry, unsurprisingly. So relative to scientists in biotechnology as a whole, scientists performing synthetic virology research of concern are enriched for traits of innovators and early adapters. I wanted to place synthetic virology on this diffusion curve, and I showed that historically the communities of scientists capable of doing synthetic virology research of concern are stuck at about the early adopters. This means that there are capability limiters and some information is still encoded in tacit knowledge and is not readily available. But the curve has a trajectory upwards. So big picture, quick recap, what this means is that biosynthesis is hard, but it's getting easier and we're poised for a takeoff. Um, historically, however, there have been limits in the actors who are capable of using the technology of synthetic virology to make weaponizable pathogens. For my second hypothesis, I found that the grounding assumption that lone insiders are motivated by ideological motives or religious extremism is empirically uncommon. Um, I looked at the types of acts that lone insiders performed against biological laboratories and the types of motivations that drove lone insiders. Um, I collected a novel data set of lone insiders perpetrating malicious acts against biological laboratories in the United States from 1990 to 2019, building on an existing data set um, and then adding the past about five years due to local news source sources pulled from LexisNexis and Factiva. Malicious acts were defined as sabotage, theft of material, theft of a pathogen or information, infection of public or a lab worker and covert entry. I then coded the motivations of these events as, as you can see here, professional gain, um, financial gain, retribution, jealousy, um, religious ideology or extremism, and an unknown motivation. This is a small end data set, and since there has not been a mass casualty attack by a lone insider, it does not directly allow us to prove that religious ideology would cause a lone insider to perpetrate a mass casualty attack. However, it does have considerable descriptive power. This data set allows us to collect summary statistics about lone insiders and characterize them. We can also then probe individual cases more fully in the data set to glean insights into the motivations of those who perpetrate malicious acts. First, we find that most malicious acts in biological laboratories are for professional gain, and this tends to result in the theft of materials and information. Second, we find that there are no cases of a lone insider clearly motivated by a religious or apocalyptic ideology. That's extremely empirically uncommon. That doesn't happen. Lastly, we find that the highest number of, of infections occurs in cases where there is an unknown motivation. So what you find when you go back and look at these cases more fully is that these unknown in cases encompass the Amerithrax attacks, which had 22 infections. If Bruce Ivins was the perpetrator, it likely had a motivation of professional gain, um, but because he was never convicted, you can't definitively state that. There's also the case of Diane T. Thompson, which led to the infection of a dozen colleagues and her boyfriend. While this case does not have a directly attributable cause, it seems unlikely that it was due to a religious ideology due to her personal relationships to the victims. This data set allows us to construct a new framework for how we consider different types of lone insiders, and we can think of them as multiple distinct populations. So there are those who steal materials and information for professional or financial gain. There are those who sabotage materials and steal out of jealousy against colleagues or for retribution against the laboratory. There are those willing to deliberately infect others for personal retributive reasons, which tends to be a low number of infections, such as one or two. Um, and then there are those willing to deliberately infect others for professional or political gain, um, and as possibly in the case of Bruce Ivins. And finally, those who self-radicalize or are planted in biological laboratories and attempt to weaponize pathogens for a mass casualty attack. The fifth group is considered the group most likely to be motivated to cause a mass casualty attack, but because they are so empirically uncommon, the broader implication is that we may have to shift priors and assumptions for hypotheses about who would perpetrate um, a mass casualty attack. Um, and it may be more likely to come from someone with a different type of incentive than an extremist or apocalyptic ideology. However, some of these trends may be changing. Synthetic virology is likely to be approaching a tipping point and we are seeing 
questions pop up with the media coverage of COVID-19. So we're seeing people with no biological knowledge attempting to perpetrate biological weapons hoaxes by claiming that they are spreading COVID-19. And this is from um, the FBI's WMD database on the right. So the overlap between uh, capability and motivation may very well be growing. And that would lead to an increased threat. So as a summary, I took a historical angle considering where we have been in the past with regard to lone insider threats, and I found that synthetic virology research of concern was limited to a few actors and lone insiders largely perpetrated biocrimes. However, we are at an inflection point and these trends may be changing. So future implications for scholarship. At the end of the day, lone insiders continue to be a concern. First, rooted in some of the limitations for my work, it is really difficult to identify the motivations of lone actors in ambiguous cases. Um, so that would be one area that would definitely need to be probed with further research. Second, more research should be performed on characterizing the motivations of life scientists as a whole to provide um, a comparison variable. Both of those areas would be rich opportunities for more interdisciplinary research at the intersection of behavioral sciences and life sciences and the social sciences. Um, lastly, I provide a new framework for considering how to think about synthetic virology capability as a trajectory with a historic threshold and a future vector. Um, and I would love to see more research that tries to place us on the threshold rather than categorizing synthetic virology as being absolutely easy or absolutely hard. The big policy takeaway from this is that pandemic preparedness is key. Obviously, we're seeing that in real life. But if the goal is to prevent a mass casualty attack, that could be perpetrated by technology that's taking off, um, then you should focus on preventing overwhelming the healthcare system. And since the recreation of existing pathogens is what's becoming easier, there's also the possibility that we have existing vaccines and existing countermeasures. Naturally occurring pathogens, to put this into a little bit of context again with COVID, are difficult to defend against because if they show new mutations, we don't have vaccines. But assuming that the viruses that are being made have sequenced genomes, we're already very familiar with them and we can develop countermeasures. So this means that preparedness can be very effective when um, trying to uh, work against mass casualty loan insider attacks. So I have a whole host of people to thank, including our wonderful professors, Professor Ziegart and Professor Ewing, um, our TA, Dr. Muir, and my advisors, Professor Stearns and Dr. Palmer. And thank you guys also who tuned in for paying attention and watching me talk. Right, thank you. So, um, as is the tradition, uh, we'll turn to the advisor for the first question. So, uh, Dr. Megan Palmer. Megan? Wonderful. Um, thanks so much, and, and thanks, Eva, for a really wonderful presentation. I'm doing um, double duty here because um, uh, Tim Stearns couldn't join for the whole part, but I knew that, that he wishes um, that he could. Um, so I, I first, I again wanted to congratulate you on really um, being in the spirit of what I think the CSAC Honors Program is doing and combining you know, your technical uh, background and expertise in bioengineering with some really challenging topics in, in international security. And you, you definitely took a challenging topic here, um, especially in trying to contextualize the rationale for events that we haven't seen. Um, and so along those lines, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, I, I'll use Jeremy Weinstein's uh, framing here, which I think is nice, um, on one thing that you've learned and, and one thing to uh, extrapolate upon. So in, in terms of, of what you have learned, you took a really interesting approach to, rather than diving into the technology um, specifically and trying to say, is this one part of the technology easy and hard, rather trying to identify the community of practitioners that might have special expertise that is poised to diffuse. Um, and so my question is, what did you learn about the power of those two different types of assessments? Those that the, um, the, the, the national academies might have taken in really doing technology and capability assessment versus the communities of practice. Which one do you think is more powerful? How would you marry those in time? And then in terms of extrapolation, you ended with the suggestion that we need to invest in healthcare capacities and response um, with, the, with the idea that these types of events might occur and we need to be prepared for them. But if one of the best investment strategies is around prevention, would you focus in on personnel, on materials, or on information controls? Where would you put your priorities? Thank you. Um, those are two great questions. 
Um, so to answer the first question, I think that quantifying, for example, the amount of time and um, the resources required to make these viruses is an extremely powerful tool. But I also think that you can then get caught into an argument that you can't extract yourself from, um, where one group will say it's easy for these reasons and the other group will say, no, it's difficult because there's still tacit knowledge um, that's required. And it's really difficult to solve that, that question and that fundamental tension without looking at the groups and the people who have actually attempted to uh, operationalize this technology in their, in their laboratories. And so I think it's a question of like that, that looking at the communities that, that have the expertise to do this, um, rather than being more powerful or less powerful than the other metric, is a way of resolving that tension in the existing assessment of capabilities. Um, and to go on to your second question, um, I think that the controlling the spread of materials is an extremely difficult challenge due to the aforementioned um, trajectory of DNA sequencing and DNA synthesis. Um, but controlling the spread of information and personnel security are possible. I think that at the end of the day, personnel security is probably the biggest concern. Um, and that may just be also um, as a result of the way that I've chosen to look at this question is that I really care about the actors who are choosing to undertake this act and perpetrate this kind of attack. Um, but I also think that as this information gets codified, that would send us up our trajectory. But I am concerned that it's not, that it wouldn't be possible to prevent the codification and spread of that kind of knowledge without also preventing um, other types of important research. And Adam will be talking more about that in his thesis on dual use research of concern. Um, yeah, so that's my answer. I think that the personnel is probably, for me, the most important factor. Okay, Antigone? Um, my question is similar to that which Megan Palmer just expressed. So at the end, you emphasize the, emotion, the importance of pandemic preparedness, but I'm curious as to what your stance is on, is it on prevention of such leaks. And when it comes to either accidental leaks of biomedical materials, as well as purposeful ones, do you think the preventative measures are sort of singular or do you think different approaches have to be taken to preventing purposeful attacks? Meaning, should the emphasis just be on imposing, I guess, uh, physical constraints to make it more difficult to leak biomedical materials or should the emphasis be on trying to identify members of laboratories who seem to have, uh, to, to see, who seem potentially guilty or suspect? Okay. Great question, Antigone. So to start talking um, about some of the physical constraints on laboratory leaks, the way that laboratories work now is that they're divided by biosafety levels. And these biosafety levels each have their own different levels of safety and security um, that hopefully will protect the broader population and the individuals working in the laboratories. So very dangerous um, viruses are in BSL-3, BSL-4 labs. So that's the way that the physical constraints are set up now. We can see that this has failed. So for example, um, in a laboratory in the United States, they found a vial of smallpox, and um, that is a problem. So we know that these, that these can fail, but on the whole, um, these physical constraints are, I think, our best bet for preventing naturally occurring um, viruses from escaping, like a laboratory that they're being studied in, in addition to people behaving responsibly with their laboratory materials. So I think that both of those things do need to be um, considered, and they are. So that personnel reliability programs and biosafety programs are currently um, both operationalized in conjunction with each other. When it comes to protecting against um, lone insider attacks, I would bring your attention back to my first few slides where I pointed out that in these reports, it's found that lone insiders have the capability to acquire a virus if they want to, because they work inside of these laboratories. And for that reason, I would think that um, the calculus flips a little bit. So again, both of them are important, but in that case, the slightly more important one is controlling the actor that's permitted to access the sensitive material. Right, Andrew? 
Thank you, Eva, for a really compelling presentation. Um, so I'm curious about the policy implications of your work, and I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the discussion of the personnel. So I'm curious if you could describe what insights from your research would you apply to insider threat programs in um, bi biological laboratories? How would you recommend that the directors of these institutions um, uh, devise their insider threat programs um, with this, uh, with the findings um, that, you've, that you've shared with us today? Absolutely. Um, that's a great question, Andrew. So what you find in these case studies is that frequently there are signalers before um, this type of thing happens. So they are, so in not, in not in all cases, in some cases, such as cases for professional gain, um, it can be that somebody leaves the laboratory to go to a conference, brings some cells in their briefcase, and nobody's really talking about how they've been a danger in the lab. But in cases where you do see lots of infections, there are alarm bells sounded. So in the case of Bruce Ivins, his colleagues expressed discomfort with the way that he was interacting with them. Um, he had um, a therapist who actually asked not to work with him anymore because she was extremely distressed by what she was hearing and she wondered whether she had a legal obligation to report it. And so I think that there are signalers and I think that it's important that insider threat programs um, focus on saying like in cases where you think that there is reasonable suspicion that somebody might not even be perpetrating an attack, but is just feeling unwell or is likely to do something rash. Um, it's your responsibility to ensure that that you bring that up. And it's also right on the part of the laboratory, the responsibility not to unduly punish people who may have mental illnesses but are not going to perpetrate an attack. Um, but I think that creating a robust social network and a strong safety net of colleagues is really the important part. Hey, thank you. Adam? Hi, uh, great job, Eva. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on um, well, whether addressing these policy implications might require um, a different consideration for publicly funded research and privately funded research. Um, if so, what that might look like. Yeah, so um, that's an interesting question. So uh, to get a little bit into what Adam is saying, for those of you who are not as familiar with this area, I think um, an example of publicly funded research um, would be research funded by the NIH. But there's also examples such as Tonics Pharmaceuticals, um, in which there was research funded for virus synthesis that was funded by the company for the purpose of creating a vaccine. And so the difference there is that if it's publicly funded research, you can freeze funding. And if it's privately funded research, you can't do that. But what you can still do um, is have, I mean, first of all, no privately funded company would want there to be a loan insider threat originating from that company. So best practices in insider threat management are still um, important and would probably still be followed. But second of all, um, you can, there are controls, for example, on the DNA synthesis sequences that you order to be synthesized, and there are other controls from other commercial companies and commercial laboratories that are in place. Does that answer your question of like the differences in the policy implications? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, Asmandar, you want to uh, read the questions from the Sure. Lab? Sure, so we have questions. The first question is from um, anonymous attendee. Um, and uh, he or she is asking, should we prepare and or respond differently to a naturally occurring uh, pathogen versus a pathogen released by a non-state actor? Great question. Um, prepare, in a sense, yes, because as I was discussing with personnel response reliability programs, you should be able to prevent um, insider threats from releasing pathogens, ideally. Um, but in the sense that the vaccines that people will be releasing and the vac and or sorry the viruses that people will be releasing and the viruses that are naturally occurring um, could both be basically treated with the same um, antivirals and vaccines. So in that sense, a naturally occurring pathogen, um, especially if it's a novel pathogen, has a very high pandemic potential. And if it's not a novel novel pathogen, you may it may be treated the same way as an existing virus that is released. Uh, from a laboratory and that there might be existing um, vaccines, but it can be thought of as a regional outbreak. Um, you do have the complicator with intentionally released viruses, that there's somebody going around trying like, to infect as many people as possible. So obviously there's an entire investigative element there of preventing that from happening and shutting that down. 
Um, but once that's occurred, a lot of the treatments are the same. Thank you. The second question is from uh, Morgan Kaplan, um, and he's asking, he's saying fascinating research. And then his question is, I'm curious who you think is most responsible for preventing loan biotechs. Is it the labs themselves, uh, larger cross-lab oversight organizations, the state, federal government? Uh, whose jurisdiction does prevention fall, uh, prevention fall under, and are there opportunities for collaboration across these efforts? I absolutely believe that the correct answer to that question is that there's collaboration across these actors. I think that the federal government has the resources and um, the responsibility to create best practice guidelines. Those best practice guidelines can be considered mandatory for laboratories, um, as in the case of like BSL-4 is a standard, and if you don't follow that standard, you cannot be considered a BSL-4 laboratory. But that being said, it is, you know, under the jurisdiction of the laboratories to make sure that they are following those best practices. And so it's a joint responsibility problem. It's a common actor problem. I think that the federal government and states have um, a wonderful role to play in establishing some of these best, best practices, but then it's up to the laboratories to implement them. One final question. Um, and this is um, um, anonymous. Uh, it says, within each of the motivation categories you gave, did you identify any of the factors demographic, geographic, among others, which loan actors had in common? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think that one of the things that we're seeing um, in part is that it's changing a little bit. So recently there has been like more theft of biological material. Um, there were several cases in like 2019, uh, 2018, 2017. And so given that there are relatively few cases, that's like not um, statistically significant, but it's significant to look at. And I think that that's because you're seeing biotechnology become better able to be used for financial gain. So if you can actually use those cell lines to make a profit, you have a greater incentive to steal them. Um, so I think that that is like temporally a trend that I've been seeing. Um, beyond that, you know, both males and females, um, they work in different positions in the lab. And I think that it's a pretty diverse population of people. What's really interesting, this is not a part of the question, but I'm gonna talk about it because I'm interested in it, um, is that in order to get to the stage where you're a lone insider in a laboratory, typically, if you have access to these kinds of materials, you're a lab technician or a PhD. So you've done an undergraduate or PhD work. And this is really interesting because um, the typical non-state actor or terrorist actor is normally um, a younger unmarried male. So in the terrorist literature, like that's the statement, it's younger unmarried males who are politically motivated. And what you find is that the ages of people who commit these kinds of bio crimes is much higher than the ages of people who are estimated to commit um, generally terror attacks. All right, with that uh, interesting observation, I think uh, we're at the end of the questions, but I'll let Dr. Palmer maybe say the uh, have the last word uh, for this presentation. Great. Well, again, I just wanted to thank Eva for taking on this um, challenging topic and uh, for you know being brave enough to go early on and perhaps wise and getting early feedback so that as you go to the next stage of writing, you'll get to the chance to incorporate all of this into um, sort of a coherent thesis. But you know, I think there's a, a really interesting um, meta issue here is when you point to um, personnel, right, and, and how do you uh, draw bridges between personnel who know about security or aware of it. Um, and I think it's mechanisms like this that we begin to pilot what these types of programs look like. So thank you for um, being part of that. And I'm really excited to see um, you wrap up the rest of your findings in, in, your, in your thesis presentation in the written form. So thanks so much for, for letting me and others be involved. Right, thank you. And I want to, you know, we're thanking both speakers, but I want to thank the audience and point out that next Thursday at 1.30, we'll have three more excellent presentations. So please join us uh, uh, next week, uh, because this is actually a lot of fun to see uh, finally these projects arrive at a uh, uh, really polished uh, state. So my thanks to everyone.